Hey everyone, this is Kit Cabello with Hard Lens Media, and I have a special guest. This is an exclusive interview with an independent presidential candidate uh, that is running. He is not with the Green Party or the Libertarian uh, Party. He is His name is Mark Charles. He is a dual citizen of the United States as well as the Navajo Nation. And with that being said, I am very proud to introduce him to all of you guys, our viewers and subscribers. So Mark Charles, uh, for our viewers and subscribers, because corporate media chooses to ignore third party candidates, uh, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and really how you got started with your campaign and really what else is happening? Absolutely, thank you very much for having me today. Let me just introduce myself traditionally. So Yat A, Mark Charles Yunishia, Sin Bakay Dinet Anishlin, the Toy Huglini Basuchin, in our Navajo culture, when we introduce ourselves, we always give our four clans. We're matrilineal as a people with our identities coming from our mother's mother. My mother's mother is American of Dutch heritage, and so I say, loosely translated, that means I'm from the wooden shoe people. My second clan, my father's mother, is Toi which is the waters that flow together. My third clan, my mother's father, is also Sinbukedinea. And my fourth clan, my father's father, is Totochitni, which is the Bitterwater clan. It's one of the original clans of our Navajo people. I also want to acknowledge that I'm speaking to you today from Washington, D.C., which is the land of the Piscataway. The Piscataway are the nation. They're, they're the indigenous hosts of these lands. They lived here. They hunted here. They fished here. They raised their families here long before Columbus got lost at sea. Mm -hmm. And I want to acknowledge them as the host people of the land and thank them for their stewardship of these lands. All right, I, jo I joined the campaign, the race, about a year ago. It was the end of May when I announced my campaign. And I, I put a video up on my social media. It's a nine-minute campaign video where I frame my campaign as an 18-month journey of understanding American history and especially some of the foundational-level problems we have as a nation, um, challenges with our Declaration of Independence, our Constitution, Supreme Court case law, many ways in which our foundations are both racist, are racist, sexist, and white supremacist. Mm -hmm. um, the Declaration of Independence, uh, for example, 30 lines after the statement, all men are created equal, refers to natives as merciless Indian savages. The Constitution, which begins with the words, we the people, Article 1, Section 2, which defines who's covered by this Constitution, never mentions women, specifically excludes natives, and counts Africans as three-fifths of a person. If you read the 13th Amendment, you'll see that we've never abolished slavery. It states neither slavery nor involuntary servitude except as a punishment for crime, whereof the party has been duly convicted shall exist within the United States. The 13th Amendment didn't abolish slavery. It redefined and codified it under the jurisdiction of the criminal justice system. This is the same criminal justice system that murdered George Floyd and lynched um, Ahmad, Ahmad Arbery. And so this is why we have these problems. And so one of the reasons I'm running for president is because I know we need to deal with these challenges we're facing, whether it's um, white supremacy, racism, and sexism, whether it's uh, wanting to have health care be a right instead of a privilege, whether it's dealing with a native uh, issue in Indian country known as missing and murdered indigenous women and girls, whether it's dealing with our systemic um, uh, income inequality, all of these issues are rooted in our foundations, and we have to address the foundations there. And so that's one of the reasons I'm running as for president, is because I want to deal with the foundational level issues so that we can actually do what the theme of my campaign is all about, which is to build a nation where for the very first time, we the people truly means all the people. So I think it's important that we really uh, bring up this factor, too, um, and that is the problem that third parties have in this country. Uh, I've interviewed Greens, I've interviewed Libertarians, I've interviewed Socialists and non-affiliate independents. Uh, when they're running for any kind of office, there's always this huge, massive challenge, a lot of roadblocks, be it at the state level or at the federal level, to stop really any independent candidate from getting involved in this two-party race. And I find it disgusting because I believe that we should truly have an open, direct democracy. I believe that we should have a parliamentary system. I believe that we should, as citizens, have multiple choices in who we want to represent us because 40 percent of Americans now identify themselves as independents. And I think after this election cycle, with the choices of Biden and Trump, two old men who clearly has some cognitive issues, I think a lot of people want to look outside that box. So 
for you specifically, what were some of the challenges that you had to face in regards to one filing as an independent running for president, but also what are some of the challenges that you have to deal with in regards to getting on the ballot nationwide? Well, running as an independent, our, as you know very well, our, our government is designed around this very simplistic two-party system, which turns every dialogue binary. And the media largely supports this system. And so even in the past year, for example, um, I'm the only Native American running in this race. I uh, am running as an independent. And there were two Native American forums that were held this year. The first one was last August. It was the Frank Lemire Native American Presidential Forum. And I attended that forum along with about 10 other the Democratic candidates. Elizabeth Warren was there. Bernie Sanders was there. Um, Julian Castro was there. Kamala Harris was there. There were 10 of the some of the top Democratic candidates at this forum, and I was there myself, and the forum went very well. I was able to engage with the audience. We were talking, obviously, about Native issues. And after the forum, Esquire wrote an article, and their article was titled, Elizabeth Warren was well-received at the Native Forum, but Mark Charles was the main event. Mm. So I was on stage with 10 of the top candidates in the race and did very well. Didn't just hold my own, but was even... Um, seen as some of the best candidate there, and yet national media never covered me. ABC, NBC, CBS, Fox News, um, CNN, MSNBC didn't touch my campaign. And there were actually several other events I was at with the Democratic candidates where these news media outlets literally wrote me out of events, just didn't even report that I was there, even though they did stories on these events but would just exclude my name altogether. And so one of the biggest challenges we have besides ballot access and besides um, just dealing with this two-party system is the media really works to perpetuate the simplistic two-party system and does not provide media coverage, even going as far as to write candidates out of events so they can keep the focus on the two major parties. Mm -hmm. And so when it comes down to uh, the challenges for third parties, you know, there's always this talking point by the establishment, especially now with everyone so afraid of Donald Trump and Joe Biden clearly having some issues uh, unto himself. Um, you know, everyone's saying, well, you, now's not the time to risk voting third party. Now's not the time to support third party candidates. What do you want to say to those critics that are basically saying, uh, no, no, we have to uh, vote blue no matter who? Yeah, I tell them, watch my announcement video on my campaign website, MarkCharles2020.com. I have this nine-minute announcement video. We released it over a year ago, and I watched it again probably about three weeks ago, and it choked me up. Mm -hmm. We talked about the systemic white supremacy, racism, and sexism in the foundation. Mm -hmm. We talked about how people of color, especially African Americans, Native Americans, have been marginalized by this system. We talk about how women have been left out. All the things that we have been experiencing as a nation, not just in the past month since the lynching of George Floyd, but literally in the past five months as the pandemic has hit and it's been our marginalized communities that have felt, have borne the brunt of not only the infections, but even the deaths from COVID-19, as well as being the, some of the frontline workers who are working in, in grocery stores and delivery services. And um, so there's been, this huge exposure, again, of how people from the margins are really at the front lines of some of the most um, devastated groups by not only police violence, but also by COVID-19. Mm -hmm. And so when you watch our video, it just makes it so clear that our campaign is one of the few campaigns that actually understands what the root of the problem is. And we named it, we identified it, not three weeks ago, we named it a year ago. Right. And so to this day, one of my best campaign tools is to get people to watch my campaign video. Right. So, well, so social media is definitely a new platform in which people can uh, share their perspectives, their points of view, and more importantly, you know, get the message out. Absolutely. And that's one of the reasons why we're running in this campaign in 2020, mm -hmm. because it's one of the few points in our history, and this window is going to close, where you can have a national, even a global audience for the price of a library card mm -hmm. and maybe some of your privacy. 
And so we don't necessarily have to go through the mainstream network media mm. to get our message out, which saves us a lot of money and gives us access to some of the largest voting blocks out there, which are not boomers, but they're millennials. All right. And now uh, before I want definitely want to switch things up now because I want to talk about policy. But first, I want to address this super chat. And un unfortunately, I will not be able to pronounce the name properly. But uh, this is from one of our subscribers, Ayana, who gave us a twenty dollars super chat. First peoples uh, for uh, president. First peoples for government. Um, I am Ayana. You're going to have to set and send me a way to pronounce that. Um, um, I cannot pronounce her tribe's name. Um, uh, we will never have racial equality until we address and accept our racist history from the first ship of Europeans, elect first people for office, and I, for one, am on, on board with that. I am all on board for a, a new change and change in exactly how we can bring in a true democracy to our government that's long overdue. So thank you so much, Ayana, for uh, making that super chat. But now uh, let's address some of your policies and actually bring them up. So uh, first and foremost, I want to get started with the prison industrial complex, as well as police brutality, because it's quite clear we're seeing um, on social media numerous accounts of police abusing their power, tear gassing American citizens, uh, killing American citizens, and yet there seems to be this massive pushback from the establishment saying, oh, no, no, no we're going to do some training period for the police. Don't call for defunding the police. And then when it comes down to addressing the prison, the prison industrial complex, we're we're not acknowledging the fact that a lot of cheap labor or free labor is being done by citizens who are behind bars. And then when they get out, well, they have no opportunity at all. And then they're put right back into the prison industrial complex. So a two part question, how, how would you potentially deal with uh, the lack of accountability for police in this country? And at the same time too, addressing the prison industrial complex. Yeah. So one of the things in our criminal justice system, including the prisons, the policing, even our court system needs a major overhaul, a major, um, major reforms happening in those systems. And right now, you are hearing, if you listen to both uh, Donald Trump and Joe Biden, they are suggesting various types of reforms, whether it's to ban certain chokeholds, or I think Joe Biden is suggesting we train officers to shoot people in the knees instead of in the chest. Um, you know, they're, they're having these debates on how we need to reform the criminal justice system by doing sort of these these visible changes but again as i as i said earlier the 13th amendment institutionalizes white supremacy and mm -hmm. constitutionally protects slavery within our criminal justice system neither slavery nor involuntary servitude except as a punishment for crime whereof the party has been duly convicted so it was in the united states mm -hmm. so if we want true criminal justice prison and police reform, we have to start by abolishing slavery. It sounds weird to say that in 2020, but it's absolutely true. Mm -hmm. And so I am the only candidate in this race right now whose platform and my criminal justice reform begins not with banning chokeholds, but with abolishing slavery. Mm -hmm. And if we, not that that's going to be the magic cure all. But until we remove that institutionalized white supremacy, and until we, we remove this constitutional protection for this dehumanizing practice, we are never going to be able to truly reform our policing system, our prison system, or mm -hmm. our criminal justice system. There is, there is, this is the reason why the United States of America incarcerates its citizens at the highest rate of any country in the world and why we incarcerate our people of color at three to five times the rate we incarcerate white people. It's because mm -hmm. slavery is still legal within our prison system. Right. So and we need to start our changes there and then allow it to work up to change the other pieces that we see more visibly. And of course, you know, because we have money in politics where corporations are people, money is speech, um, you know, a lot of our politicians, be they Democrat or Republican, take money from the corporations that are either tied to the prison industrial complex or for the prison industrial complex itself, and then they're the ones writing the laws. So again, it's uh, really disgusting to think that this is the system that we have, and we still have slavery here in this country, uh, but it's been given a far more prettier name thanks to our neoliberal system. So I think it's important to address this, though. Um, the 
insane war on drugs, the failure that is known as the war on drugs, has helped incarcerate a lot of uh, African American uh, people, Latinos, people of color, and it's because of this failed war on drugs that we're seeing the prison industrial complex still have some life into it. But h how do we really deal with the war on drugs? How do we finally end it? And not on top of that, too, there's still an ongoing opioid crisis. So what is your policy in regards towards the war on drugs and this opioid crisis that we are dealing with? Again, this is where we have to deal with these foundations. So today I rolled out my 100 day plan for my first 100 days in office. Congratulations. And I have proposed a list of, of not amendments, but edits that we need to make to our constitution. I actually went through the constitution and with a strike through font, removed the racist, the sexist, and the white supremacist language that's in our constitution. I didn't change the balance of powers. I didn't change checks and balances. I merely removed the racist, sexist, and white supremacist language. I took out the clause in the 13th Amendment. I took out um, the phrases in Article 1, Section 2 that exclude natives and count Africans as three-fifths of a person. There are 51 gender-specific male pronouns in the entire Constitution. There's not a single female pronoun in the Constitution. So every time I, have, I found a he, him, or his, I changed it to a gender-neutral pronoun or a proper noun. These are just some basic level changes, but we see how this plays out when we look at, especially the war on drugs, which came about through the Reagan administration in the 80s, which really was a war on race. And then we look at um, the incarceration that, that got perfected by the Clinton administration in the 90s. And if you look at the history of drug abuse and especially opioid addiction, it was in the 80s and 90s where people of color were dying at a much higher rate from opioid addiction than any other demographic in the, in the country. In the late 90s, the, the white American population began to catch up with, the, with the, the African American and other communities of color in the, the rate of death that they were dying from opioid addiction. And in the early 2000s, they surpassed, or late 1990s, they surpassed them. And then early 2000s, the rate of white Americans dying from opioid addiction skyrocketed. And this was the exact same point where now, instead of treating opioid addiction as a criminal offense, we begin treating it as a public health crisis. This is where we begin developing things that we could administer on the streets to keep people alive and we begin investing more money into treatment. But these things didn't happen until more white people began dying of this than people of color. Mm -hmm. And so it's not that we're treating it incorrectly now, it's that we didn't start treating it that way until we got we more white people started dying. Why? Because our foundations are based on the fact that people of color and natives, African Americans and natives, are less than human. I've written a book called um, Unsettling Truths, the ongoing dehumanizing legacy of the doctrine of discovery. My co-author is actually from Chicago. He's a professor at North Park Seminary. His name is Sing Chan Ra. We published our book about uh, last November it came out, and it goes through the history of this dehumanizing doctrine of discovery that came out of the Catholic Church in the 1400s and gets embedded into the foundations of our nation. This doctrine of discovery in 1823 becomes the legal precedent for land titles, basically arguing that because natives are savages, we are only occupants of the land, and Europeans, who are fully human, have the fee title, the right of discovery to the land, so therefore they're the true title holders. That case and the doctrine of discovery get referenced by the Supreme Court as recently as 2005, when the United Indian Nation was sued by the city of Sherrill of New York because they were trying to claim sovereignty over some of their traditional lands. Mm -hmm. And the opinion that basically said that the United Indian Nation were still savages and could not reclaim sovereignty over their lands and referenced in the first footnote of the case, the doctrine of discovery, that opinion was written and delivered by Ruth Bader Ginsburg. <laughs> See, the challenge is, is when your, your land titles are based on a doctrine of discovery, mm -hmm. white supremacy becomes a bipartisan value. I actually have a TEDx talk about this out. It's called, We the People, the Three Most Misunderstood Words in US History. And so these are the challenges we're facing. This is why, because our laws, the prosperity of this nation are still dependent upon certain people groups being categorized as less than human. Right. And until we change that, 
we are not going to be able to fix those problems. And we saw that very clearly in the opioid problem, mm -hmm. where it wasn't until more white people began dying than people of color that we actually treated it for what it was, which is a public health crisis instead of a criminal justice issue. Now, it's also important to bring this issue up, too, and this is something that I think a lot of us, um, especially when some of us got involved into activism or being aware of what's happening uh, outside of our comfort zones, uh, it's quite clear that a lot of the Native American reservations are still under threat from environmental racism, pollution, police brutality, and you know we, we've seen, of course, the reports for, about the Dakota Access Pipeline, what's happening there. Um, there's also many reservations that are dealing with uranium mining, and there's a lack of resources, lack of opportunities there. So as an independent candidate, what is your policy towards helping preserve the Native American reservations, making sure the Native Americans all across this country have equal rights and equal protections because for far too long, the United States government has been committing abuse after abuse after abuse. I mean, the list can go on and on and on, but at the end of the day, what's happening there by the government, by the corporations is inhumane. So yeah. what is your policy? Because I think it's long overdue that the people who live in those lands finally have their voices heard. One of the primary ways that Native nations um, have a relationship with the federal government and become federally recognized tribes is through a treaty. Mm. Our nation has written hundreds of treaties with Native nations here in the United States. Now, the Constitution states that treaties are the supreme law of the land. But nearly every single treaty the U.S. government has written with Native nations has been broken. In fact, you, there was a, a crisis just a few months ago where during this global pandemic, um, <clears throat> the Trump administration disestablished reservation lands for the Wampanoag tribe in, Ma in, in Massachusetts. They did this in the middle of the pandemic, which was like evicting someone from their house um, in the middle of while well, your city's being hit by a hurricane. I mean, it was, just, it was completely undressed and absolutely uncalled for. And there was a large outcry. Now, that reservation had been established by the Obama administration, of which Vice President Joe Biden was in office with him as well. And so there was this large public outcry against the Trump administration for disestablishing this reservation. And in a response to that, Joe Biden issued a, a statement where he said one of the most important responsibilities of the federal government is to take lands into trust on behalf of Native nations. And he said that was crucial to establishing Native sovereignty. I responded to this in the, in the op-ed I wrote called um, about nostalgia during that same time. And in this op-ed, I said, why would Joe Biden ever argue that? Could you imagine him saying that to one of our allies, France or Britain, for example? Britain, it is crucial in establishing a government-to-government -government relationship that you allow us to take your lands into trust on your behalf. This is important for your sovereignty as a nation. He would never say that. Why then would he say it to Native nations? Hmm. Again, because of the doctrine of discovery, because of how this relationship has been developed, which is that Native Americans are savages and not fully human. Hmm. We actually do not have title over our reservation lands. Those lands are held in trust by the U.S. government on our behalf because of the doctrine of discovery. And so while it was unjust that the, the Trump administration disestablished this reservation, it was actually just as unjust that the Biden administration sees that as what it looks like to express sovereignty, which is to let this very parental nation hold your lands in trust for you. Mm -hmm. And so this is the challenge that we're facing as a nation. So for me as president, I would come in and I would actually begin to look and reevaluate the treaties that have been written and begin to build true nation to nation relationships between the US government and these native nations. Mm -hmm. The constitution states that treaties are the supreme law of the land. And if we have treaties with groups of people who are still living to this day, we need to make sure we honor those treaties. So that Great. is one of the things I will do to, to begin to adjust this relationship that has for hundreds of years been very, very broken between the US government and native nations. Right. And I, I think it's that's something that's perhaps uh, that's long overdue and needs to be heard finally. And I, it's 
it, it, with the numerous times we've covered so many stories about environmental racism happening all across this country, um, we've, we've seen time and time again pipelines and refinery and mining that's happening in Native American reservations. And the thing is, is that that's unright, that that's, that's not fair at all. And there's a massive amount of pollution that's happening and communities are being devastated by the amount of deadly material that's being put into the environment, you know, in the soil, in the water, in the air. And um, it really says a lot about a country uh, and how it treats its citizens or anyone that it has uh, signed a treaty with. But obviously at this point, there needs to be massive reform within our government. So um, there's a whole bunch of other questions I do want to ask you, but I just want to ask just a quick lightning round kind of question. In regards towards uh, you being on the ballot, one of our viewers uh, is asking, uh, are you on most of the state ballots? And if not, uh, how, how close are you? So we are not <clears throat> yet. On, well, we will be on the Vermont state ballot because due to the pandemic, they've actually removed their signature requirement and we just have to submit our paperwork to them. Mm -hmm. There are several other states we can get on the ballot by paying a fee, Colorado, Louisiana, and we're working towards the one that has the highest fee, which is um, Oklahoma, $35,000. Okay. Um, every other state has a signature requirement, and due to the pandemic, because we have not been able to physically collect signatures, a lot of that signature collection has been put on hold. So in Illinois, for example, the requirement was that we needed 25,000 signatures to get on the ballot in the state of Illinois. We just found out about a week ago that we can now get on the ballot by collecting electronic signatures, and the number has been reduced from 25,000 to 2,500. So our campaign is going to begin working. Um, we, we're creating our form right now so we can begin collecting these electronic signatures, and hopefully in the next few days, um, we are hiring our, our um, national coordinator for um, ballot access is coming on board with our campaign tomorrow. So hopefully within a day or two, we'll have that Illinois um, form out there. But uh, there's other states where we're collecting them remotely. So the state of New Mexico, the state of Alaska, the state of North Dakota, and the state of New Hampshire all allow us to collect signatures remotely. So we've begun the process in those states. There are many states, including some of the bigger ones like New York, that have halted their signature collection and have not informed us what their new process is going to be due to the COVID-19 pandemic. All so right. um, on our website, um, markcharles2020.com, we have a ballot access link. And there you can click on your state and you will see the latest information our campaign has on what we need to do to collect ballots or to get on the ballot within each of the 50 states. And we're, our goal, would we'd love to be on the ballot in all 50 states. We're not sure how possible that's going to be because of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And so we're also looking now at what do we need to do to get right in access on as many states as possible so people can write us in. I definitely want to do uh, another follow-up interview with you. There's a lot I want to ask you in regards towards um, other policy issues that you have on your campaign website. So I think it's important that as we end this interview, uh, for our viewers and subscribers, um, are there any events that you want to uh, mention that are happening, and where can people find you online and on social media? Yeah, so our, uh, the best place is to go to our website, which is markcharles2020.com. You can make a donation there. You can sign up to read our newsletter. You can... Um, volunteer with us from there. We have official campaign accounts on um, on Instagram, on mm -hmm. Facebook, and we just opened one up on TikTok the other day, so we're going to make our first TikTok um, uh, uh, social media post in a few days, hopefully. And then on uh, on Twitter and on Instagram, I'm there on those accounts personally as Wireless Hogan. That was my username long before I started running for office, so W-I-R-E-L-E-S-S-H-O-G-A-N, and that's my username on most social media. I'm most active on Facebook, Twitter, and um, Instagram are the ones I use the most. But yeah, our official campaign accounts, Mark Charles 2020, you can find on Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Mark Charles. He's running as an independent candidate for the office of president of the United States. And I, for one, am a supporter of third party candidates. And I think it's long overdue that we have multiple choices instead of the two party system. So uh, with that being said, I want to thank all our viewers and subscribers sure. for joining us. Uh, this is Kit Cabello's Hard Lens Media. Peace, everyone. Let us all do we can to build a better future. Mm -hmm.